Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Biotech Exam Prep. I hope all of you are doing really well. Through the course of this brief important lecture, let's cover some important pointers with regards to your English in India. So, without further ado, I think let's just quickly get started. Let's just make sure that all of us are um, are are looking at the concept of English in India. Even on YouTube, there have been a couple of videos where we've spoken about the development of English in India. See, for English in India, there are three broad things that you have to cover. The first one is the historical aspects, like who all are coming, what is the Charter Act, uh, what is uh, what are the various education initiatives that are taking place in terms of the Education Act, what is the contribution of Orientalist, Anglicanist, or uh, what is the contribution that Macaulay is making. Um, so, so a lot of questions that come uh, in from the various acts that are coming in order to introduce English in India. Uh, so that is one part of it. The second part of it, you get questions related. to indian english writers and the third part of it which has started coming in is a lot of new topics like comparative literature translations today there is a question in today's class that we will practice on sujit mukherji uh, sujit mukherji is one such writer who's a cricketer and he's talking about translation as well and he says translation is basically one method of decolonization we'll talk more about this in greater detail we have also picked up questions hand picked questions like today we'll be practicing a question on vishwa uh, you know on on vishwa sahitya so when we are talking about world literature it's actually our um, uh, so called bard of bengal that is rabindranath tagore who had already given us a concept of vishwa sahitya that is world literature as we talk about it even before goethe's coming even before other writers are talking about world literature um, or, or not before actually but after but then you know there is a very comparative understanding of literature that is being provided that is being given uh, by uh, rabindranath tagore good morning everybody uh, good morning good morning um there was a question varsha uh, feel free to visit the website i think all the details about the test series everything is mentioned over there good morning suraj hi shikha hi lichi hi pooja hi chandni devalina rasmita uh, good morning everybody good morning all right so without further ado i think let's just very very quickly dive into a proper understanding of our unit that is english in india right um now before we get started with the topic of discussion today we will try and take a look at some questions right and these questions are not like those four option type questions questions in the sense like what is it for a better understanding and then moving on to the topic that we are having at hand all right so that is how we going to be proceeding with today's session so without further ado let's just very quickly get started with today's session on english in india uh so the first uh, question for everybody and there are a couple of other youtube lectures also that we've given on english in india so you can go on youtube and type english in india and you can uh, search either bep bajus exam prep or you can search uh, by the name of grade up you'll be able to find a lot of videos that we've done a lot of practice questions i think over youtube itself we've practiced over uh, approximately over 50 questions on uh, english in india so it will give you a good question bank which you can always rely on right uh, so uh, who established the royal asiatic society of bengal in 1784 who was this this master that we're talking about in a way he is an orientalist also his research is also sometimes quoted that you know he went back to his research yes absolutely so uh, we we had rit uh, rit uh, rikta rikta gave the answer for the very first time excellent that's such a beautiful name rikta huh? what does it mean uh, shikha pooja everybody is given the right answers william jones is the right answer. answer uh, the royal asiatic society in bengal was founded in 1784 this is founded by sir william jones right so sir william jones is absolutely the right answer over here as an ice breaker question you can actually go and take a look at the website also um, and and uh, we must remember that you know all these questions on important people they of course come in your exams uh, even in your uh, set exams or your phd entrances most of the times you're getting these kind of questions so it's always a good idea to be prepared by them uh, who is William Jones is the founder of the Asiatic Society uh, the the founder of the Asiatic Society and what we are able to see is that the britishers when they starting their rule there's a gentleman warren hastings who's very important and william jones under the patronage of warren hastings 
under the uh, the patronage of Warren Hastings is conducting his activities. So you know there were there were a group of people who were called uh, British uh, or Britain Brahmins. Uh, Britain Brahmins. Why were they called Britain Brahmins? And you can make comparison with the Boston Brahmins, the fireside poets like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, so so what were they? They were trying to look at Sanskrit knowledge. They had the access to Sanskritized teaching. They had access to the oriental scriptures which were there and they were trying to look at it yesterday in the 8 pm lecture we had done a question uh, on linguistics which was talking about the uh, you know the indo european language family that we were discussing about so uh, we were able to see that orientalists like sir william jones are trying to come they're trying to interrogate they're trying to literally get very fascinated by the languages that are spoken over here and of course that is how um, that is how they go ahead that is how they 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 are actually uh, moving forward altogether so he is of course known for his collection of ideology literature scientific research of about almost 20000 volumes which has sanskrit arabic persian you know persian was actually the lingua franca before english was replaced persian was the lingua franca in india then it was replaced by english as the lingua franca during the british rule so earlier when we are talking about the official language there's a question on the lingua franca aspect also that we'll talk about today uh, so Persian was actually originally uh, the language which was there. So he was trying to interrogate, really intrigued by the wealth of wisdom that was available in India. Uh, the Ishatic Society of Bengal, of course, uh, this is exactly what uh, even uh, Britannica has to say about the Ishatic Society. I'm just changing the color of my pen because otherwise in yellow you won't be able to see anything. Or let me just change it to another uh, color. Okay, so the Ishatic Society of Bengal, uh, it was founded in 1784 by Sir William Jones very important he is an orientalist he was encouraging oriental studies who are the orientalists the orientalists are britain uh, you know so they're famously called as britain brahmins um, they are people who are favoring the indian education which is available these are people who are favoring the uh, the, the so called native education and the languages which are there they're really inspired by it. they're really trying to interrogate more about it so these are what uh, we we are famously calling as the the so-called Orientalists that we are having, right? So these are our Orientalists. Uh, Jones, of course, is is trying to uh, literally spearhead the entire movement of finding, laying down the foundations of Ishatic Society of Bengal. He is a scholar from Oxford University. He came to Calcutta. Right now, it's called Kolkata. Uh, so uh, he came to Calcutta, and um, you know, he he was a person who genuinely wanted to research more. Rather, first he made the tall claims that it is predominantly, um, you know, it is predominantly the, the Indian languages which are the original languages but later on he says no even English is a part of the original ones uh, so Ashatic society was of course getting a lot of support by Warren Hastings the governor general the then governor general um, so uh, uh, Warren Hastings played a very pivotal role in shaping uh, the constituencies altogether and uh, till Jones death we were able to see that you know uh, the Ashatic society as the name itself suggests was a very key uh, organization that was helping people understand Understand the Indian languages better. There was a proper study of Indian languages that was spearheaded. So it was headquartered in Calcutta. Uh, so of course, a really important work. And the Journal of the Ishatic Society was published regularly to key, like you know, to publish the key findings of the Ishatic Society under William uh, Jones. So uh, Warren Hastings, the patron, and William Jones, the person who's actually spearheading the entire um, act of getting the Ishatic Society together. These are the two pointers that you can put it down in your note copy. Uh, just make sure that you're preparing proper notes for English in India. You can make a separate compartment and make proper notes on English in India and keep these notes handy now for uh, a lot of time. British history, Indian writings, because even when you're teaching, these notes will actually come very handy uh, for taking those university lectures. Who's the writer of the Throtar Nama, the fictional saga of seven generations of an Anglo-Indian family? Uh, we will talk about, we'll have a class in the coming days on diasporic literature because I think we haven't really conducted a class per se on diasporic literature there were a few classes that we conducted on the Baijus exam prep application platform but none on the youtube platform i believe so we will very soon schedule a class on diasporic literature i will make a note of it um but still uh, like you know when we are talking about the new masala diaspora or the you know the, the indian sugar diaspora we'll, we'll talk more about these categories also which are coming in uh but yes absolutely absolutely so vahida shalini aziz rasmita everybody has answered it correctly. 
right everybody has answered it uh, correctly all together yes 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 you will be getting you will be getting it uh, so alan sile is the person who's writing the throther nama the throther nama um, and, and not just the throther nama you've actually started getting questions on alan sile is a lot of uh, works that alan sile uh, sile is uh, writing and spearheading and like i said diasporic literature has become suddenly very important uh, this is of course telling you as the question was only saying seven generation of the throthers who are there um, and uh, we are able to to see that you know how brilliantly it's trying to uh, cover the sweeping bound uh, the, the 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 so called sweeping uh, generations that are getting captured look at war and peace for instance by tolstoy so it's like a kind of a magnum opus which is trying to cover a lot of aspects all together and so does this work also wants to cover uh, so there's an elaborate study all together in throther nama the sweeping shift that it's trying to cover uh, also what we are able to see is that uh, in 18th century there's a throther um, and uh, he is actually going earthward uh, while he is going earthward to his death right he surveys the land because obviously you're coming earthward you're coming downwards so you're able to see the land you're able to see everything from a hot air balloon imagine you are you are there in the space and then you're coming over here um, and you know you when you're falling on the earth you're able to see a lot of things from the hot air balloon that you're there so beautifully weaved together very child like narrative but still telling you about some very important themes all together right uh, and uh, you know uh, so so after of course the first 18th century throther comes in thereafter we are able to see the seventh uh, throther comes in uh, so you know he's telling he's telling about his entire family's legacy all together so beautifully beautifully made all together it's telling about seven generations of the trotters who were coming in uh, the, the throther nama so to say um, and and you know there there, there is uh, this uh, this indian lunch this british dinner which keeps on reminding me of war and peace because war and peace is also starting with the aristocratic dinner uh, that is being conducted they are of course talking about the possible harm that can come in but they are engrossed in a, you know a, a, what aristocrats are really concerned about money uh, uh, tolstoy talks about it also that aristocrats were really concerned about sex money and death uh, right so those were the three pre occupations of the aristocrats uh, because money of course because they wanted to know who else is coming in their circuits so a lot of comparisons that you can draw between a lot of works that are coming in when we are looking at alan sealy's writings all together right so uh, through their nama alan sealy of course um, so this is the hot air balloon i really love this picture if anyone's read the book um, you you'll be able to identify so it's literally like you know the first throther which who comes in he's able to see it on the hot air balloon what is happening beneath and then come two centuries later his uh, seventh generation person is trying to talk about the entire family so to say so uh, a brilliant account of capturing uh, the the so called genealogy and still trying to literally talk about multiple aspects so seven generations saga of seven generation of trotters uh, and their their kingsmen who are coming in right uh, there's a french soldier of fortune also serving the british east india company that is uh, again another digression that you have like another part of it that you're having so you know the trotters the trotters uh, are are properly delineated their entire uh, seven generations are properly delineated so this is what happens in the 18th century what is happening is that the throther he is coming earthward and on his hot air balloon he is able to see everything and two centuries later the seventh throther is coming and he talks about his entire family uh, just in case because these days they started giving you the in detail questions you can remember that the first throther is your alisus's throther and the seventh throther was trying to tell about his family's eugene alisus Eugene Alistair so sometimes these days they've started giving you these kind of questions so you can always keep that in mind okay what do we call a group of english who admired oriental culture they were admirers of oriental culture uh, right and deprecated the idea of introducing western civilization into in, into india they said that we do not have to focus on westernized education we might as well give indian education to indian students right so who are these group of people that we are talking about who are these group of people that we are discussing let's just see how many of you are able to answer this correctly so sorry no 
uh, but uh, with anglicis yes uh, now you've started giving the right answer uh, but first puja uh, anglicis were actually not supporting right anglicis were not supporting they wanted to introduce western culture uh, but it was the orientalists who said don't introduce western culture just keep with stay put with the uh, the indian cultural values only right that is what they were talking about so you can keep that in mind um, and you can remember that as well so uh, these are called orientalists there's a proper debate in english in india there's a proper segmentation you have to uh, cover this topic as well what is the discussion how when the the britishers they basically english in india is trying to tell us about the history that how did english come about in india so that we are able to trace it better that now when we are talking about uh, see for instance a majority of organizations that you work with um, they always stress on communication skills right like the big fours ernst and young kpmg uh, pwc or your MBBs, your McKinsey, Bain, BCG, they, they stress a lot on communication and more often than not communication is nothing but English communication. So if you're trying to decode that what is this, what has resulted, what has led to uh, making English get that pedestal. So that is what English uh, in India is trying to interrogate that how did English come about, how was it the colonizer's language, how did we suddenly start speaking the language and then you know we uh, started getting a lot of proficiency in that language and then there was no looking back at all right and then there was no looking back at all so this is basically uh, your orientalist they're also called brahmanized britons brahmanized britons or your orientalist so to say right so these are our orientalists they're also called british orientalism is something that comes with the coming of the Britishers. Warren Hastings is coming at the same time. So Sir William Jones under patronage of Warren Hastings is starting all of this. So that is also the starting point of British imperialism. In all my lectures, even on YouTube and otherwise also on uh, when I uh, teach you English in India, I keep on telling all of you that even if you uh, invest in that NCRT book of modern history and just give it a reading, just like a common book, right? Or pick up any book on modern hi Indian history. If you have that in your mind if you have that at the back of your mind this unit becomes a lot more easier or you can watch youtube videos on modern indian history to understand how are the britishers coming when are they coming what are the fights that are taking place what are the significant fights what are the significant charters what are the significant acts which are being passed because a lot of questions then come from those acts and charters in this particular unit as well so if you just give that one read or to an ncrt modern indian history book that will really be very helpful for you to understand understand this unit very well right in which year was persian replaced by english as the official language of the indian east india company which year did persian actually replace uh, english as the official language of the indian east india company so where where which which particular zone are we talking about uh, which time uh, coordinates are we talking about? So this is in the earlier part of the 19th century where Persian was the lingua franca and then got replaced by English. And, uh, and, and slowly and steadily in a couple of years, actually English lost, uh, sorry, Persian lost its pristine value as well. And everybody was using English eventually. Uh, so what is this date that we are, uh, that we are looking at? What is this date that we are looking at? <clears throat> Yes, anybody on the chat box wants to answer it. I'm just trying to look at the chat box and see if any one of you um, has answered it. Uh, let me just put this over here in English so I can see your chat box in a better way. Yes, Aziz has answered it. Aziz has answered it correctly. 1835 is the right answer. And by 1843, it becomes like an official language altogether. Right. So uh, that is absolutely the right answer over here. Uh, Aziz has got it right. So 1835 is roughly when they're coming. And by 1843, it becomes like a very officially solidified language. And 1835 is when it is actually getting that pedestal altogether. So 1835 is when Persian is getting replaced entirely. This is the same thing. 
just like you know during the anglo norman conquest we are able to see that latin is getting replaced by english uh, latin is getting replaced by french and then suddenly french gets replaced by english in the law in the courts in the uh, in the in the legal courts in the um, you know in in the so called courts also the, that you're having like the courts of the kings so slowly and steadily these kind of changes of first take place in language so language has got a lot to do with people in power remember when we were young in 12th standard we had the last lesson by alfonso dodet which was talking about you know the last french lesson that you had um so again with the change in power with the prussians coming in how you were able to see that there was also a change in the language that was supposed to be taught right so that was another important aspect that we had right okay so please keep that aspect in mind who's the writer of romance of indian cricket and autobiography of an unknown cricketer autobiography of an unknown cricketer and romance of critic who's the person who's writing this who's the person who's writing this who's the person who's writing this i had actually uh, prefaced it in the class when we started so the class that when we were starting i had actually mentioned this as well so who's this person that we are really discussing about let's just see how many of you are able to answer this question correctly good morning everybody good morning yes lakshmi uh this is not vichay tendulkar i i really appreciate the uh, the innocence there yes uh devlina has answered it this is sujeet mukherji so sujeet mukherji uh, is writing this work sujeet mukherji is the person who's writing this work he's a translator he's a really important writer because of the fact that he was a cricketer oh sorry sorry he was a cricketer oh oh sorry I think I lost it. Yeah, he was a cricketer as well as he was a writer. Uh, additionally, when we are talking about Sujit Mukherjee, he actually said that translation is basically a transcreation. He was of the opinion that a translation can really help us um, in in going back. He he genuinely believed that you know um, that uh, that if you want to decolonize the mind, if you translate a work, because you know when you're translating, a lot of your inputs come in. It's no more the uh, the the way that the author wanted to write it, but it's your way uh, through. which you are trying to portray that uh, so sujeet mukherjee a brilliant brilliant writer cricketer writer uh, giving us a lot of ideas so uh, please remember sujeet mukherjee he has written a lot of work on literature on cricket he's written between indian wickets matched winners and he talks about the fact that there is a need for methodology to write indian literary history he says indian literary history has to be written differently you cannot rely on the uh, the counterparts that you are having previously indian british uh, history has to be written absolutely differently that is what he was talking about that is what he was uh, predominantly trying to say trying to specify also so always keep that in mind that when we talk about people like sujeet mukherjee sujeet mukherjee was very clear um, that uh, you you need to abandon the older ways if you have to write right you have to abandon the older ways altogether uh, so uh, he is of course writing works like translation as the discovery and other essays on indian literature where he talks about translation is transcreation you know for instance if somebody tells me imagine if uh, if chandni vikram suraj are my siblings okay and they tell me uh, that uh, that you know uh, just tell mama or you know just tell my family that um, you know you have done this wrong uh, neeja so of course like you know in order to not get punishment from my mom I, what what did i say oh they were saying something wrong has happened i'm not i'm not personally saying that you know it is attributed to me so translation is also a lot of authority i have the authority you don't know the language for instance if there is like you know something which is written in uh, say archaic korean uh, or archaic greek or archaic french language say for instance any uh, archaic language and and suddenly if i'm writing you'll have to believe whatever i'm telling you 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 don't have any option now of course we are living in the age of google we are living we are the facebook age so to say uh, now of course we've got online resources to validate it uh, but but you know uh, at that time when sudeep mukherjee was writing he said that translation is also great power that you're having it's a great authority it's trans creation altogether 
right it's absolutely trans creation altogether i i for instance really love a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, content that comes from the other side like a lot of turkish uh, serials or a lot of these urdu plays which come in i i consume that uh, a lot um, also because a lot of it has got to do when when i was living with my grandparents in abu dhabi we used to watch a lot of these there uh, so so um, you know there was um, there was this word in urdu which is called munafik okay now uh, if you look at the words translation munafi basically means that you are being uh, you know you, you're being uh, extremely particular you're weighing down everything right but the translation uh, in the transcript came as hypocrite now hypocrite is slightly different okay hypocrite is that i, I say something and i do something else munafik is not exactly a hypocrite okay a kind of a munafik person can be a hypocrite but when i was reading the subtitles in that drama the the, the protagonist was like uh, you know i'm i'm being really um uh, mai munafik ho rahi hu why was she saying munafik because of the fact that you know uh, if there was something that some other person had done she was having a punishment ready but when her own kid did that she was she was like uh, not really comfortable so that's not exactly hypocrisy that's not exactly hypocrisy it's just that you know you're trying to weigh it or at as per your own measures so the way you translated it now has has given you a lot of authority right has given you a lot of authority altogether so what we are able to see over here is we are in a position to look at we are in a position to um, uh, you know to see that this is the entire process of trans creation that we are uh, referring to that that translation is a post colonial activity which gives me a lot of authority so that was a major contribution you can actually read more go on shudhaganga read a little more on sujit mukherjee that there, there are brilliant uh, uh, seminal works and analysis of sujit mukherjee's writings uh, sujit mukherjee is also now included in a couple of syllabuses so if you will be like you know now you'll be clearing so you will start teaching uh, that time also you will see that a lot of it will actually come uh, also you know there's this beautiful quotation from sujit mukherjee which i really love uh, immensely because you know he's he's trying to uh, talk about very simple very simple yet true uh, as later day calibans he's calling us later day calibans we were taught english and our profit on it was that we learned how to translate so sujit mukherjee he gives a lot of power to translations imagine everybody in translation study you start you you reach out to any translation study scholar they will say translation is a very you know it's like a tight rope that you're walking on you you're never exactly there but he's saying that is what causes power if you're never exactly there that's giving you authority you can interpret it the way you wish to do it so he was the you know sujit mukherjee is bringing a very radical idea in the form of trans creation that translation is authority translation is power imagine if my mom told me something that i have to tell my nani and uh, you know i i now have the authority as as the carrier of the messenger uh, as as the carrier of the message as the messenger i have a lot of authority i can change and twist it history is also like for instance oh uh, i'm so sorry i think uh, one second let me just uh... get this off sorry i think all of you could weren't able to see the later later part right so so you know history is also telling us a lot of these uh, uh, a lot of these so called uh, dramas that you're having dramas in the sense like dramas in your syllabus english literature syllabus uh, that you have be shakespearean drama uh, or be it a uh, jacobian drama half the times the confusions have arisen because of the messenger but who is giving that authority to the messenger the messenger is always a loaded person the carrier of the message is a very loaded person that's the reason they say diplomats have got such an important task to play one diplomat not giving the right uh, you know the right picture can cause war between two countries all together so that is a kind of idea that he had out of such remembering and recording will come india's theories of translation especially translating into english brilliant writer a brilliant writer telling us about decolonization brilliant writer trying to tell us translation is trans creation sujit mukherjee cricketer as well as a writer par excellence so uh, please keep uh, keep him in mind whenever you are trying to look at your english uh, studies in india because he of course comes in uh, his doctoral thesis a lot of you ask that you know what can we take as doctoral thesis topic so his doctoral thesis that he was having that he was conducting were a passage to america reception of tagore in the united states that how was tagore perceived because remember rabindranath tagore is the first non european uh, as the recipient of the nobel prize after roosevelt like uh, roosevelt uh, had won it then uh, then he was the one of the first pioneering uh, 
uh, non-European uh, person to actually get the Nobel Prize in 1930. Who gave the lecture on Vishwa Sahitya? Vishwa Sahitya, Vishwa, that is world. Vishwa, that is world, right? Vishwa Sahitya, who's giving this lecture? Yes, Tagore is the right answer. Vaidas answered it correctly. Rabindranath Tagore. Again, very interesting read. You 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 can uh, you can read more about it. There, there is there are tons and tons of material available uh, on Shuddha Ganga on uh, you know the, the entire concept of Vishwa uh, Sahitya that Tagore talks about. There's a lot of research that has been conducted on Vishwa Sahitya. Um, you know, so Vishwa Sahitya is not a very well known essay per se of Tagore, but it's a very important essay. It's a very very important essay of Tagore. Uh, that we're able to see he wants to literally tell us about this concept of comparative studies so comparative studies so gurudev um, uh, bard of bengal is trying to tell us about the fact that yes there is world literature there is this entire uh, vishwa society and he says that an artist is uh, always having a very selfless role I cannot say that, you know, I am, uh, for instance, I am from a particular region as an artist, I should be able to absorb wherever I go. That is what he's saying. Like, I'm not an artist, but uh, I'm, I'm just telling you about what Tagore talks about. Tagore says that, you know, artist is a very selfless activity. You cannot be rigid about your boundaries. You cannot be rigid about where you're coming from. You cannot be rigid about uh, uh, what is your location like. You have to renounce all of it when you become an artist. So if you're becoming an artist, you really have to do that. Okay, so uh, please keep that aspect in mind. Uh, yes, KS Lakshmi, it's neerja.raheja at the rate grade up dot co. Uh, I'll, I'll just write this down for all of you. You, you feel free to uh, mark me an email or you can use the Baijus exam prep net application platform, neerja.raheja. I'll start, uh, you know, I'll start interacting with all of you on the IG page. I saw some comments. I'm just getting used to uh, looking at the Instagram connection. So I'll start interacting with all of you on Instagram as well. Why the post that I post, I saw a couple of comments. I'll start doing that. Nisha.raheja at the rate grade up dot co. So that is the email address. So Rabindranath Tagore, uh, Vishwa Sahitya, World Literature, trying to literally pay a lot of, uh, you know, a significant role in comparative lit literature. And what is comparative literature? When you're trying to see literature uh, on the global front remember cultural studies also talks about localization globalization uh, those are important terms in literature and this is what uh, what Rabindranath Tagore is basically trying to do uh, when it comes to the concept of Vishwa Sahitya or uh, trying to spearhead comparative uh, literature altogether so he is able to do that he is able to uh, help us undertake that entire journey for ourselves right that that was very important he's famously called as Gurudev Kabi Guru uh, Kabi so this is basically Kavi Guru, Kavi Guru, right? Uh, Vishwa Kavi, Vishwa Kavi, uh, Bard. So, so in Bangla, we don't have V. So my brother's actual name, we call him Star. That's his, uh, like, you know, that's his name uh, since centuries. Uh, but, but basically, uh, his name is Vishwanath. And we used to go to uh, Chaturanjan Bhavan for our painting classes. So um, he would be fast asleep. I was making his paintings half the time because both of us used to go into the same uh, painting classes, drawing classes uh, at Chaturanjan Bhavan. And I remember that, you know, whenever the attendance would come, uh, so his name they would write it in like because he was used to in school he was used to having his uh, roll number towards the very end and he would you know get up uh, towards the very end to say president but his, his name he'd be like Vishwanath so uh, rather they could they, they never used to pronounce it as Vishwanath right so there's no actual V that is there in Bangla you're having a B uh, that comes in so you know, uh, it's not a Kavi Guru, it's a Kavi Guru that you have, it's a uh, Vishwa Kavi that we're talking about, it's ba he's famously called as Bard of Bengal also right uh, so first non european to win the nobel prize gitanjali gora garibare janaganamana amar shonar bangla uh, brilliant brilliant writing that's the beauty of tagore altogether right that's that's the beauty of tagore and vishwa sahitya vishwa sahitya is the entire topic and and remember this is what i was telling you he says that being an artist is a very selfless activity you cannot be very rigid about your boundaries 
compare this with picture of the uh, you know portrait of the artist as a uh, as a young man so when we are talking about james joyce even james joyce says to create the uncreated conscience of my race and to renounce my political religious and other identity markers you have to renounce that you have to be completely free as a writer as an artist you cannot have prejudices then remember yesterday when we were talking about encoding and decoding by stuart hall then you have a negotiated position or you have a dominant or hegemonic position or you have an emergent position if you are having prejudices right then your encoding is not pure your encoding as an artist is actually something which is not going to be very very pure altogether so that is also something that we have to understand in a better way who is the writer of the perishable empire essays on the indian writings in Eng in india perishable empire who is writing perishable empire brilliant writer uh, she died unfortunately very um, very early on because i think in 2003 after she passed away it had actually been longer i think uh, it, it would have actually been uh, you know tremendously helpful for all of us uh, but yes of course who is the writer of the perishable empire essays on indian writings in english who is this writer that we are talking about again the recipient of sahitya academy award all the sahitya academy award winning writers you should know about them because the academy is also trying to give awards to respective luminaries all together so who's this person that we're talking about who is this uh tall stalwart a stalwart that we're we're, we're discussing the perishable empire or the perishable empire essays on indian writings in english essays on indian writings in english uh <clears throat> Aziz has given the right answer. Minakshi Mukherjee is the right answer. So you know this was actually uh, when when it was published in two thousand and one, um, it was awarded the Sahitya Academy Award uh, two years later in two thousand and three as well. The Perishable Empire. Uh, Mukherjee was trying to talk about the art of novel writing. She goes back to the nineteen fifties. She is giving you social, political, literary reasons that why um, you know how writing was developing. The three universities, Calcutta, Bombay. Bombay, Madras, the kind of role that they played, because you know they were having a a, a huge pool of library available. Now imagine, uh, imagine there was there was this uh, you know there was this video post that had gone yesterday about high growth careers. So some of the high growth careers in today's times are digital marketers, product managers, uh, fintech graduates, right? So what are we able to see? There's tech integration. You should know Power BI. You should know uh, all these kind of new age, cutting edge aspects all together. But how would we know? if we don't go to that school or that college which is teaching uh, teaching us or if we don't enroll for a course online we would not know these new tools right so we can only know about all these tools we can only know about what is happening in these tools if we enroll for these sessions so that is what minakshi mukherjee also says that these three universities at calcutta madras bombay provided a library to nurture a new cadre of indian writers who after reading after reading what the britishers were doing and the british novelists were doing started writing for their own selves all together of their own country right so that is what she talks about i mean she she points out that indian novels in english uh, will were were not very popular they were not very popular they they weren't english novels were not very popular whereas uh, if you were writing in tamil if you were writing in malayalam if you were writing in hindi urdu marathi bangla you were very popular you were very very popular so she is trying to understand why was it right why did the indian english novel fail why was it not something that was treated with a lot of um, with a lot of gusto altogether then you know when she was researching on those grounds did she come to know that uh, that that uh, you know there was another question that in the 20th century imagine now uh if i'm uh, if i'm uh, 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 the, uh, like you know just take these examples okay uh, when we were young uh, it's not that these people never used to come smart classes people used to come to our schools also but at that time nobody was interested they were like no a blackboard is fine we don't need a digital board now if you go if you're pitching a product to a school that you know we are having digital services these are digital uh, classrooms you can have uh, recorded classrooms you can have a repository of of your classes you can give it to the students etc now everybody will listen to those products right that is because we are educated we know now educated in the sense now we are digitally educated now we know the importance of such products 
earlier we never knew the importance of such kind of product uh, products like distanced uh, education in schools i remember we we in our school um, used to have even though our school was uh, a really good school uh, here in delhi ncr uh, but still you know they were also a little averse they were also like oh my god uh, why why digital learning why digital boards why smart classes immediately then slowly and steadily trends started picking up consumers were built in that direction right so that is what you're saying that the the unsuccess story of in indian novels was because we didn't have the audiences only who were well read or who had the appetite to consume that right imagine if the current ott content was given say 50 years ago everybody would be like oh my god dharam bhrasht kar rahe hai hamara right because at that time the audience was not prepared for such kind of content now the audience is prepared for such a kind of a uh, content which is considered to be slightly evolutionary in nature so she tries to look at it she tries to look at it and of course a uh, beautiful uh, beautiful writing trying to say that uh, that it wasn't the indian writers fault but it's also the audiences were not prepared altogether so brilliantly ex uh, explaining i highly recommend if any one of you wants to uh, probably go ahead and read this i think i i i would highly highly recommend all of you to actually do that so minakshi mukherjee writing the perishable empire essays on indian writings in english uh, a work by minakshi mukherjee the recipient of the 2003 sahitya academy award she is talking about the the project of novel in india she is discussing about the project of novel in india she is trying to look at that you know the, the the universities at calcutta madras and bombay they played a very critical role in mentoring these cadre of writers but unfortunately despite the writing that started uh, people were not meeting a lot of success now imagine if you don't meet success you will not continue writing right or if you are not if you if you want to become something if you are not being successful uh, over a period of time you you will probably want to give it up that oh my god i'm not getting any success this is not something which is meant for me so so that is what she's trying to interrogate she tries to ask all these questions all together and she says that bangla marathi hindi urdu tamil malayalam writings were doing well because people knew these languages there was already a uh, so you know if you have to speak the capitalistic tone there was an existing market the the target group was existing there therefore you were able to sell the product imagine if before the pandemic say 5 years ago if you were selling masks not a lot of people would buy masks only the hospitals would buy masks there would be b2b selling a business to business selling to hospitals only that you could have done but otherwise nobody would have worn masks at all right so so these are the kind of things that that she tries to look at and she is giving a understand uh, right now all of us are able to clearly uh, decipher all these concepts but at that time when minakshi mukherjee was writing say about almost uh, 20 years ago um, these things were still being asked all right and also please remember she was asking that suddenly there was a complete proliferation despite the fact that earlier they were not doing very well suddenly there was a proliferation because everybody was jumping the bandwagon everybody wanted to do for instance today everybody wants to enroll in a course that can add value to them for instance everybody will probably uh, go for a digital marketing course or everybody will go for a python course or everybody will go for a power bi course or everybody will go for a product managers course why because everybody knows that if you are doing these courses you will be settled for a salary of say 15 to 16 lakhs per annum minimum so therefore everybody is trying to take up these courses and these opportunities to get those jobs which are there right so so that is what she is looking at a brilliant writer all together must definitely take a look at it um, the first section of the book is of course trying to tell us about novels then she keeps on you know she also talks about that uh, the bhasha writing the bhasha writing the bhasha writing so the other bhashas were doing very well in comparison to english the other bhashas were better off in comparison to english she talks about all these things and these details okay uh, now we've actually looked at a couple of questions let's uh, let's let's very quickly review some things that we had already uh, spoken about in our previous lectures also for 5 minutes and then we'll wrap up uh, so we have so far been talking about in these lectures on youtube platform itself on english in india um, that how was english introduced english was introduced by britishers why was it introduced it was introduced because they wanted to create a cadre of people who could help them in their 
administrative purposes, right, in their administrative roles and responsibilities. So what was the major reason for English being introduced? The major reason for English being introduced according to Gauri Vishwanathan in Masks of Conquest is that they wanted to create basically British servants to be very simple. Right, Gauri Vishwanathan says they wanted to create a cadre of people who would be uh, British in their upbringing and they would be able to serve the Britishers better. You could use them for administrative purposes. That was the masks of conquest. That is the masks of conquest that she's talking about. That is the masks of conquest that she's discussing. Right, so so this is something that she was talking about. There's this concept of Babu English. There's the concept of Babu English that emerges. What is Babu English? So uh, a lot of people were trying to, of course, start speaking in English. They understood uh, suddenly the demand for English speaking tutors also skyrocketed. So a lot of people who were conducting their education abroad and they were coming back. They were hired by rich landlords, rich zamindars to help their students learn the language English because they knew that you know now this is the language which will get you um, the so-called interaction interface with the people in power altogether so what we are able to see over here is that uh, everybody uh, and of course when you start mimicking when you start using uh, imagine a foreigner trying to speak hindi they, you will be able to identify right you will be able to identify we had uh, you know we had a professor for some time um, and this was a visiting faculty should come uh, from Norway, Norway and the way she would use hindi you can, you can easily figure it out that um, um, etc. So you can figure it out. You can figure it out that, okay, you know, the, the Hindi is not something uh, like, like you and I will speak. So that is uh, how similarly Babu English was a kind of an English which was trying to be, um, the clerks and officers were trying to speak. Um, they were trying to interact. It was a cool thing uh, at that particular juncture to start speaking. Uh, so, so everybody was looking at it. So class of Babus, who were Babus? These were British clerks doing British menial jobs, administrative jobs, so to say. There were people engaged in menial jobs that were there. And then there was Butler English also. Now, Butler English or Beerish English, Butler English is like uh, uh, a lot of these movies also make fun of it, right? There's this, this Amir Khan movie where, you know, uh, where Karishma Kapoor is saying thank you and uh, he says you come, come. So that is a, an example of butler English that you have. That means you're not able to speak entirely. You cannot say, for instance, you're welcome. Uh, so so that was a kind of a butler English that was developing, but still you're speaking. You're still speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, definitely. You're still trying to speak. You're still trying to in imitate. So Babu's English, clear, accented English spoken by uh, by clerks who were at, at premium positions uh, in, in the British Empire and then you had the butler English, their servants, the Babu's servants, so to say, who were also trying to speak in English. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many of you know, so there is this, uh, just like you've got Bollywood, similarly there's Bollywood, okay? And in Bollywood, uh, there's this movie which is called Ada Uda, which is almost a very similar version of Hindi medium. What Arauda wants to talk about is that how uh, these schools in Punjab are trying to implement English and Gurumukhi is actually losing its sheen. Nobody wants to take Punjabi. Even though Punjabi songs would be really uh, very famous, but nobody wants to learn the, the language, which is leading to the decline of Punjabi as a language. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's this very funny incident in that particular um, in that particular movie, Arauda, where this gentleman who doesn't know English at all, um, and, and still, you know, he speaks English and nobody knows uh, English. Everybody's like, wow. Oh, this is amazing and suddenly when a group of uh, you know school students english medium school students come for a, a, a village trip that is when they realize that you know oh my god he's he's really speaking abysmal english and which is not even correct so to say but the villagers never understand it the villagers like wow you know he speaks really good english right so uh, so that is a, that is an example of butler english these kind of uh, uh, you know these kind of people you will all be able to see in, in cinema every now and then altogether so beerish english grammatically incorrect english remember nism is the key also talks about this kind of english that is coming in so uh, you know now the topic is now the, the stress on regional languages that why do we even have to speak in english if we don't know english that's fine let's just continue using Hindi or let's just continue using our regional languages. Why do we have to put on uh, this facade so to say? All right. Uh, major documents, unfortunately, that we are having were also written in English. Uh, that was a major problem because considering our, our constitution itself, a major part come, came in English. The legal judgments even today are, are written in English. I remember that uh, when, when um, 
after college we were just asking that how can we uh, increase our linguistic ability so everybody would tell us because you know in my dadaji circuit everybody was a chief justice they said that you know just read these uh, these uh, verdicts that come out and look at the kind of english that the lawyers are using so so always remember and even for the clat exam that you give like you know the log legal entrances that you're giving um, your english has to be absolutely uh, clipped all together it needs to be very very uh, precise all together right so 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 again we are trying to uh, unearth we are trying to decode why this importance is given to english right why was it the question that english study scholars are asking is that why why was it that such a kind of a pedestal was given to english uh, of course macaulay's minutes are very popular second february 1835 macaulay presented his minutes on indian education and what was the aim the aim was to make sure that indians are getting educated in english language this is famously termed as the manifesto of english education in india it is famously called as the manifesto of english education in india that is the major most famous name manifesto of english education in india right so that is what we are able to see um, of course he sees talking about how uh, you know that we need to create england indians in blood and color but english in taste and opinions uh, so that you know they they are able to deal with all the administrative jobs that we'll be giving to them and uh, always remember there has been a lot of discussion that we are using a colonizers language uh, we need to abandon the use but then people like actually say no that we we shouldn't abandon the use because this makes us reach out to a larger audience it's all together and then we are able to articulate our concerns in a better manner so there are both these uh, kind of opinions that are there uh, the most obnoxious line that he says a single shelf of a good european library was worth the whole native literature of india and arabia so that is what he talks about as well uh, so extremely um, uh it's being yes 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 shalini elisa do little's english is also an example that you can give over here of cockney english rather remember that uh, that uh, keats and byron for instance they're fighting because keats is considered keats and hazlitt they considered to be inferior they considered to be cockney school of poets altogether so that is true uh macaulay of course visited india in 1834 and his minutes are of course a very important document that we are able to see which is like we said coming on the 2nd of uh, february 1835 so within an year's time he was able to figure out that what is good for us right so that was something which was a really sad part uh okay and uh, he was supposed to be the person controlling public instruction how public instruction was supposed to be uh, catered to that was a primary version that he had to actually look at okay so so that uh, that predominantly let's just cover at least macaulay's bit uh, so that you know then we can wrap it up um who were the people who were in favor of using english education uh, macaulay charles grant lord william benedict all of them were favoring all of them were saying that you should use english in india all of them genuinely thought that favoring english in india was important uh, they thought that you know you have to if you want to raise a cadre of uh, of uh, proper uh, indians who are well trained in english language then this is how you have to deal with it um, and and please remember raja ram mohan roy unintentionally unknowingly was also playing in the hands of the britishers uh, he is the father of indian renaissance the father of bengal renaissance uh, but you know he is considered to be an early macaulay why is he called early macaulay because he was also supporting uh, british education he was also supporting uh, the fact that you know english education should be given he was supporting it he was the potting it so that is another major problem that we have there's a concept what is this downward filtration theory downward filtration theory actually meant that there is no need to worry about everybody just give uh, uh, education to a few indians automatically it will trigger it will trickle down to the bottom of the rung altogether so you know there will be an aura that will get created people would want to learn the language altogether and that is how you can actually see the flourishing of english in india we pause over here uh, there is there's of course lots to cover in english in india uh, what i would suggest is that you know this entire weekend like we did a little uh, on cultural studies a little on english in india try to cover these topics try to cover try to look at these topics uh, across the span of this entire week uh, you have a entire uh, like you know uh, uh, say say a week's time before we meet next on the youtube platform and if in case we'll be meeting regularly on youtube i'll let you know uh, by tuesday i i i have a meeting so i'll, I'll let you know whether we 
we'll be meeting regularly on YouTube or not. Uh, but, but yes, of course, Saturdays and Sundays, we're meeting at 9 a.m. And we are meeting daily on Baidu's exam prep application, the free, free platform as well. Uh, so please feel free till then. You have this entire week. Get your notes prepared. Uh, get your notes uh, all ready, all set for all these topics, right? Just try and work out proper notes on both these topics so that you have, uh, you know, a proper compilation of in English in India as well as your cultural studies, okay? And we'll keep on practicing. Tomorrow, I'll, I'll be meeting on the Baidu's exam prep application for the free class and we'll cover questions related to language uh, as well. So you can revise that component also. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. That's, that's really sweet. Uh, Shika, thanks a ton, everybody, for joining on time. I really appreciate all of you joining on a Sunday morning. And I wish all the students who are writing the Northeast SLET exam uh, a very, um, like, you know, uh, the, the best that they can probably produce out of it. Thanks a ton, everyone, for joining in. If you have any other concerns, please feel free to let us know. It was great interacting with all of you. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Surbi, Devalina, Kriti, Divyani, uh, Nutal, Varsha. Thanks a ton. Thanks a ton, everybody. All right. God bless. Enjoy your Sunday. Have uh, spend time with family. Uh, do your or complete your pending work. Don't forget to study as well. Uh, just probably put earplugs and study whatever you can. Take good care of your health as well have good healthy breakfast and i'll see you guys very soon take good care of yourselves enjoy your sundays everybody bye see you